Welcome everyone. Uh, this is Lloyd Rankin. Uh, I will be uh, doing the presentation today with Ben Swan, uh, one of the committee chairs of the Scalability Committee. We're just going to wait a minute uh, and uh, get the presentation started once everybody's had a chance to arrive. Steve, if you could notify me when uh, the numbers are such that we can get going. Sure. Yeah, there's a few attendees. Mm -hmm. Give it uh, 30 more seconds here and we should be good to go. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we're going to be giving you an update on the uh, scalability project. And uh, this is the agenda that we're gonna be covering today. We'll give you a very quick overview on AWP, then we're gonna talk about scalability. We're gonna talk about project classification and we're pretty excited. We're gonna be uh, showing you the uh, screening tool that we'll be uh, releasing with the model. We're also gonna talk about how that's gonna allow you to rank your projects and determine uh, how to manage it. And we're going to introduce a new work phase planning system we've been working on for quite some time and then give you the opportunity to ask some questions and get some answers. So our mandate is to focus on those projects that are 100 million and smaller. And uh, that's particularly relevant because the AWP model was originally developed for uh, very large projects and we found that over time people have been applying it to smaller projects but found that there needs to be some adjustment done and uh, we, we were basically getting requests for the last couple of years can you give us some suggestions as to how we can modify this to make it work for these smaller projects we already know from uh, the research that's been done that Productivity, cost, schedule, safety, quality, predictability can all improve with advanced work packaging. Uh, we want to take those benefits down to smaller projects. The uh, committee is made up of uh, myself, Lloyd Rankin. Uh, we've got Jeremy Furzer representing the owners. We've got Randy Friesen representing engineering and supply chain. Kirk Harris from Black and Beach is uh, focused on front end construction and also uh, path of construction. And Ben Swan, who's on the uh, presentation today, uh, focused on work phase planning. Uh, but in addition, we've got over 40 professionals from the owner, contractor communities uh, made up of engineering, supply chain, and construction. And these are from both Canada and the United States. So uh, we've had a lot of people working on this problem for some time now, and we're quite excited to start uh, showing you what we've come up with. Uh, for those of you familiar with AWP, uh, I apologize for going over this again, but uh, for those of you who aren't, I'm gonna give you a, a three slide overview of what advanced work packaging is. Uh, basically advanced work packaging starts from the beginning of the project and carries through to the end of the project. It's broken into two phases, the front end component and the work phase planning component. The front end comp component really involves everything done to design and uh, determine how we're going to build the project. So it carries this all the way from uh, pre-feed all the way through to detailed engineering. 
This is important because how we package the project early on is going to have a huge impact on how we execute when we get to the field. Work phase planning was actually developed before the uh, front end component of AWP. And we found that while it improved the performance of the projects, uh, there were still challenges if the engineering and the procurement didn't uh, come out in a sequence that was going to support construction. So what are the benefits? What are we chasing on this? Uh, well, we have evidence through uh, research that was conducted by the Construction Industry Institute that we can see 25% improvements in productivity, labor productivity. We can see 10% reductions in total installed cost. And we've seen a number of projects where the uh, TRIF rate has actually dropped to zero. In other words, no one has been hurt on a project. Um, and that hasn't even been true on people driving to and from the project. So uh, that's a pretty impressive outcome. We've seen better schedule attainment. We've seen uh, cases where rework has dropped to zero, and we've seen much better predictability. And we want to see this on the smaller projects as well. So where has AWP been used to date? Um, I guess uh, the question is almost where hasn't it been used? We're seeing it used extensively in North and South America, all through Europe, uh, Australia, uh, all over the world. And it is continuing to expand in its application. So let's, let's get to the principles behind advanced work packaging. The first principle is it doesn't matter what you're trying to build, you have to determine how you're going to build the project. And that comes down the path of construction. You always have to do that, whether you're building something in your backyard or whether you're building a several billion dollar facility, the first step is figuring out how you're going to build it. The next is determining how you're going to package it. Uh, so we talk about construction work packages and engineering work packages, but on very, very simple projects, it may just be drawings. Uh, it may be a list of materials. So how we're going to package it is something that we always have to do, but what that's going to look like won't always be the same. We then have to determine how we're going to manage the packages. And again, there's some great tools out there. Uh, Hexacon's built some, Bentley's built some, CCC, Aviva, they've built tools. Uh, but on very simple projects, that could be an Excel spreadsheet. It could be the back of a cigarette case. Uh, we always have to do it, but how we do it will change. We also have to make sure that we have all of the necessary information to be able to do the project. That could be engineering, that could be vendor documentation. Uh, so information, materials, equipment, those are all going to be required what will change is what the nature of those things are, but the fact that we have to determine them and have them available, always true. Uh, also, what labor is going to be required to do the project. And then finally, we want to make sure that all of those requirements are satisfied before execution. These are well established principles of AWP, they never change. However, the practices will change. And, you know, here's two projects that we're looking at doing. One is building a fence, the other one is building a facility. Are we going to do all of those principles? Absolutely. Are they gonna look exactly the same for the two projects? I sure hope not. And what we found when we were going through this is, on some of the smaller projects, especially the ones that are very familiar to us. Uh, we have people that have done them time and time again. You just don't have to have the same level of formality. And I just want you to uh, think of the following. One of our committee members indicated that they had a project that was approximately $170 million. Now, at $200 million, they had to go through 
and treat it as a major project. And so they said, well, let's take a look at this project and let's start applying all the things we do for major projects to it and see what happens. The project went from 170 million to $220 million. And a lot of it was additional reviews, additional process, additional structures, a lot of extra people, and it was the same project. So they had a $50 million increase in the cost of doing the project, just going from being a small project to a major project. And they said a lot of the things that we were gonna do, we just didn't have to do for the project. So we really wanna make sure that we're very mindful and that we apply what is necessary, no more, no less. So one of the things I said I was pretty excited about was that we've developed a project classification tool. And it assesses projects based on their familiarity and their complexity. And I think the easiest way to show it to you is to use it. So we're going to take a hypothetical project and I'm going to open up the Excel spreadsheet and we'll go through the questions and uh, we'll see how this one sorts out. The project that I'm looking at is a valve replacement project. The government has uh, required that for water crossings, we have to change the uh, valves that are controlling it for environmental reasons. Um, it's not optional, we have to do it. And now we're going to take a look and see uh, if we can assess these. Now, we talk about project types. There's two types of projects. There's, types, uh, there's type one projects, which are very familiar. We've done them before. We know what they're all about. We're comfortable with them. And then there's type two projects, which are more of a one-off. First thing I'm gonna do is go through the familiarity. So this question is asking me about scope familiarity. And I'm going to click on the description and you'll see there's a little drop down arrow. And it'll give me two statements. The first statement is this is a duplicate project with scope of work similar to that previously executed. The second is that it's a one-off project. So we're going to say that this one is in fact one that we've done before. As soon as I select that, you see that this becomes type one. The next one we're going to take a look at, is it being managed as part of a portfolio or a program or is it being managed as an individual project? Well, we've got to do this several hundred times, so we've actually set it up as a program. So that keeps it as a type one. Is there standardized design to this? Well, uh, if we're doing it new every single time, then it's not standardized design. If we're setting it up the same way most cases and then just making minor alterations it is, this would be a standardized design. Uh, this next one, it says, uh, uh, is the execution team experienced? Have they done this particular type of project before or have they not done this project before? Well, if I have a team that's experienced, they've done this before, then that'll come up as a type one. Now let's take a look at the next question. Uh, what type of construction contract is being planned for this project? So my two options are, is this an owner or EPC partner with general contractors, or is this an owner or EPC where we're going to get formal proposals, we're going to treat it like we've never done it before? In this case, we have done this, we've got contracts in place, so that makes it a type one project. And then the uh, final question is asking about how we're going to uh, purchase the materials and equipment. And if the EPC or the owner is going to be purchasing it, um, it's uh, going to fall into a type one. So in this particular case, 
let's go back to that question and let's say that uh, they're uh, going to go ahead and ask for evaluations. Well, let's just think about that for a second. If we do this all the time, if we've located vendors, if we've got a standard process in place, would that make sense for a program? Probably not. So it's going to stay as a type one. So in this case, we've got a project that we're very, very familiar with, our contractors are familiar with it. That's going to influence how we're going to manage it. Now, the second thing we're going to look at is the complexity type. So is this green field or is this brown field? Well, if we're doing it on all of our projects, then it will probably be a combination of the two. But let's, let's say uh, this particular one we're looking at is a brown field. How many construction areas are there going to be? Well, in this particular case, we're just replacing a valve, so there's only going to be one or maybe two construction areas. So that's going to place it as a low complexity. Next question, how many disciplines do we have? Well, in this case, we're probably looking at less than seven disciplines, so that would make it low complexity. Next one, uh, mechanical electrical instrumentation uh, and control tie-ins. So in this particular case, is there going to be hot work? Yes, there will. Sorry. Or, uh, sorry, is there going to be hot work or are we going to have to shut down the system? We would have to temporarily shut down the system. So that increases the complexity. Uh, are there known geohazards? Well, in this particular project's case, let's say that there is not going to be uh, any severe geohazards, but we are going to have to do some excavation. So that's going to introduce a little bit of complexity. How deep are we going to have to go on these uh, excavations that we're doing? Well, let's say that, that we do have to go over 6.5 meters. So that's going to put it at high complexity. Is there going to be any working at heights? No, there isn't. Do we have control over when we're going to do this? Because if we do, we'll go summer and fall. And let's say we do, so we're going to go low complexity there. Are we working under a compressed schedule? Well, let's say in this particular case, it's not schedule driven, so that would put it as low. And then the final question, is the project site remote? And let's say that in this particular project's case, it is not remote. When we go through and take a look at this particular project, we can see that it's coming up on the matrix as a green which means that it's very familiar to us and it's very low risk. As soon as you've answered all the questions, it will automatically assess which, which quadrant the project falls into. So I'm going to go back to my presentation, hopefully. There we go. And you can see that we, we can apply this to any project that we're looking at. Now, that's going to give us a ranking. And basically, you can see that anything that's green is both very familiar to us and very low risk. We've got another one that is very, uh, very familiar to us, but has a higher level of complexity, and that's a solar farm project. And then we've got projects that we're less familiar with. If we did that valve replacement the very first time, the complexity wouldn't change, but our familiarity with it would be lower. And you can see it's yellow, which means that it's intermediate rank. And then the top one is a de-bottlenecking exercise. In that case, we're not very familiar with it because every de-bottlenecking is different and it's also quite complex. So this is how we categorize. So let's take a look at this valve replacement project. 
Uh, as I said, we're going to be putting in these valves across the country. We have hundreds of them to do. Uh, we've established that we're going to use one engineering firm to do all the work for us, and we're going to use local contractors to do the installation. Uh, this is based on an actual uh, an actual program that one of the uh, development team had, so it's very realistic. So let's start looking at how would we do this project? Well, the first thing we'll look at is contract strategy. In this particular case, a decision was made by the owner that they were going to use a larger engineering firm to do all of the engineering for all of the valve replacements. Uh, this way they could reuse much of the work. And then they would identify competent local contractors that were preferred. They, they were already doing work for the company. They were already um, onboarded to actually do the installation. As far as the path of construction went, because they've done this so many times, they've actually got a standardized path of construction. And all they have to do is modify it very slightly for any different geographic conditions or access issues. So this speeds up the path of construction development significantly. In this particular case, even though the project is quite small, the owner is determined that they need to be fairly heavily involved. And one of the reasons for this is there is a sensitive environmental aspect to this. So although it might be a little counterintuitive, the owner does need to be heavily involved, even though they're very familiar with this, even though it's a very small, relatively speaking, project. Uh, each one of these installations is two to five million dollars, but they're doing hundreds of them. So it's actually a pretty expensive program, but each individual one's not that expensive. We're not going to be using workface planners for this. This is a very short duration project. The execution of it is uh, only going to last two to four weeks maximum, and that's with setup and teardown. So we're not going to be producing a lot of installation work packages. We will be able to use our superintendents and GFs to create these. And we already have done this many times before, so we can provide them with a starting point, which will speed up the development as well. When it comes to engineering work packages, we're not really going to need to build them. We're going to have engineering information, and we're going to convert that engineering information into construction work packages, but we're not going to be building multiple construction work packages. This is a small enough project, so we'll have one construction work area, and we will have uh, construction work packages with all of the necessary disciplines built into them. This is also a small enough project so that we won't need to have procurement work processes. We'll, we'll need to manage our materials, but in this case, all the materials will be uh, available on site prior to construction start. And when it comes to the installation work packages, those will be developed by discipline, but we're looking at, you know, two or three packages in each case. So the short duration of this project is making it very simple to execute. When it comes to reporting, we're going to have very low formality. We don't have to have uh, eight-week look-aheads uh, when we're talking about a project that's only going to last a month. Uh, we will have reporting, but uh, in many cases, uh, on a large project, what will happen is you don't do anything until you get written instructions. On these smaller projects, we may go with verbal authorization followed by a written uh, confirmation. So the level of formality is a little bit less on these projects because it's appropriate. The risk associated with the project is also less. When it comes to the schedule, we've done this literally tens or hundreds of times before. We know exactly how long it's going to take, what's going to be involved. We have a standardized schedule. We can just modify that to make it work for this particular project. We're going to manage this as a program, not as an individual project. We'll buy our materials for multiple locations. 
We'll have our staff manage across multiple projects. Um, and that's going to give us some additional benefits in terms of efficiency. When it comes to the long lead items, the owner is going to do it, but most of the purchasing will be done through the EP house with the contractor only focused on shorts. So um, before I move on, I just want to open this up to the team. We've got uh, Kirk Harris from uh, Black and Veatch and Randy Friesen from Fleur and Ben Swan from, uh, well, actually Element Industrial. And uh, I just want to see, do, do any of the three of you have any comments that you'd like to add to what I just said before we move on to the solar farm? So Steve, could you look for a hand up from one of those three gentlemen? Well, it looks like we don't have any comments at this time. Okay. Either I've done a great job or they're not sure how to use the technology. I'm assuming it's the first, not the second. Okay, so let's go to the second project. This was the solar farm. Uh, again, based on a real project, um, each of these solar farms is about a $30 million endeavor, and they're being done uh, across the country. And um, if you look at the picture there, which is just a representation, you can see there's a lot of repetitive work in putting in place these solar farms. Um, but there's a lot more complexity than just swapping one valve out. So this would fall into the category of being a type one, very familiar, uh, but high complexity. And so in this case, what we found was the owner decided they were gonna go full EPC. They found a contractor that had done this repeatedly, understood the process, uh, so full EPC made the most sense to them. Uh, the nature of the work is that it is quite standardized, but when you start looking at the entire farm, there needs to be slightly more significant modifications than we saw in the case of the valve replacement. So it's very standardized, but there will be some minor modifications when we go to uh, different locations, different configurations, but, but still very manageable. Uh, in this particular case, the owner is really not that involved in the actual building of the site with the exception of oversight. Um, they've hired an EPC that knows what they're doing to run it for them. They don't have to be as involved in the day-to-day decision-making. When it comes to the planning, uh, again, we don't need work phase planners because in this particular case, all of these IWPs have been built before. Uh, there aren't that many of them that need to be built. And we've got superintendents and GFs that have done this before. And so they can repurpose those IWPs and they have time to do it. So again, not going to be a work phase planning situation, but definitely skilled construction folks building the packages. In this case, we will be building in engineering work packages, and we will make sure that all of those deliverables are in place before we start construction. Just because of the nature of this, it's very fast paced construction, and we're going to have the EWPs together. We're going to take the CWAs, we're gonna early identify the uh, systems, we're going to do our CWPs based on uh, discipline specific work, uh, and we're going to uh, try and get each, each of these uh, done through a very solid contracting strategy. In this case, we will use a procurement work process. We will tie the resources to the construction and engineering work packages. We'll make sure this is all included in the RFQs that we put out. We'll make sure that we have all the data necessary to support those EWPs, that's vendor documentation. And we're going to stage materials to make the uh, actual 
construction go as smoothly as possible. Our IWP uh, scope is going to be uh, divided from the CWPs. Again, there's not going to be a huge number of them, but we'll have done them before and we can repurpose them and build these quite quickly. In this particular case, it's a slightly longer planning and execution horizon, so we will have more formal reporting structures. Uh, we've done this a number of times before, so we have standardized schedules that we can modify to make work in this particular case. There's more variability in the uh, solar farm, so it's largely a program, but there may be some cases where we have to change the uh, design a little bit and that would make it fall into a portfolio. Again, very repeatable, very understandable, but uh, uh, not identical. And then finally, when it comes to the materials, uh, we're, we're gonna let the EPC do the purchasing. And for each one of those blocks, we have to look at it and make the decision, what's the best way to handle this? In our report, we'll be giving you some recommendations. So before I move on to the worked example, uh, in this case, uh, Kirk, I'm hoping you have uh, a couple of comments. And uh, same thing for you, Randy and Ben. So can we open the mic and see if uh, any of them would like to add a comment or two? So we have. Um, Kurt on the line. I believe he is a on the phone. I'm just not sure if he is going to be able to speak to us through that. Um, okay. What about uh, Randy? Kirk is with uh, Jason DL, so if you can unmute Jason of the attendees, you'll be able to get Kirk to chat. Great. Okay, I've sent the microphone over to Jason. Jason, are you able to uh, to speak? Apologies for uh, technical delays here. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, well Lloyd, you did a you did a very good job with that. I just want to make a comment to the to the group and everyone on the webinar that this project is a is a perfect example of using that uh, uh, screening tool. Uh, we actually have built uh, multiple of these solar projects. And, uh, we did three in 2016, and those were our first, so they would have fell in that type two high complexity. We had to develop the path of construction. We had to develop the CWAs, CWPs, IWPs, so on and so forth. But then we had four more projects in 2017, and we just, uh, we've got four more this year. And they have definitely moved to the type one. Um, we're very familiar with them. We're, we're able to, to reuse the path of construction, CWA, CWPs, IWPs, PWPs. The thing that you have to, to, to pay attention to and what keeps it from being a type one low complexity is each job, the, uh, they're, they're laid out differently although the work is the same, you still have to, to look at the, the path of construction. Do you start north from south, east to west, and so on. But once you, uh, you know, identify the, you know, the differences in the layout of the project and the local uh, logistics, the rest of it's pretty standardized and, and you can uh, you really save a lot of time and effort uh, by reusing um, your your information and in the, in the material that you've created. So uh, very, uh, it's been very, uh, it's been very good for us. So can I get you to stay on the line for a sec, uh, Kirk? Uh, yes. We've got a worked example for the solar farm that includes a number of uh, 
uh, sample documents. And I was wondering if you could just take a minute to talk about what some of those uh, sample documents are and, uh, uh, you know, just give people a high level of what we're going to have in terms of a solar farm work example. Sure. So, uh, do you want me to start or, or would, okay, so included in that, we'll have samples of path of construction, we'll have samples of schedule, we'll have samples of um, what might be included in your construction execution plan, your engineering plan, um, uh, what what um, what are what would you say are the most important things that we'll have in the work example, uh, Kirk? Well, first of all, it's, it's very important that you, you take the the path of construction and you refine it and verify uh, that that's the way you're going to build this particular solar farm. Um, then you take and develop your your. Um, project schedule, the level three. Um, and actually the, the level three is really already developed. You're reusing it from past, but you still have to, to refine it and uh, verify um, with, once you've gone through your path of construction exercise. Um, being able to, to have a good local subcontract uh, strategy plan uh, those those do change. Uh, the subcontracts themselves are very similar, but depending the area that you're working in, you have different. You know, you have a new subcontractor, so um, that's really important to have a good subcontract strategy uh, with some of this work. Um, other than that, uh, the commissioning and startup plan is very very similar. Uh, so you just change, you know, equipment numbers and tags for uh, project specific, but the uh, sequence of turnover and the sequence of uh, commissioning and startup are almost identical. Okay. So um, I think you can see there's going to be a lot of really helpful resources uh, that will come out of the solar project as a worked example. Now I'm, just very briefly, I'm not sure why, but I'm having trouble advancing the slide. Steve, uh, any suggestions as to why that would be? Uh, I think I think I can just re reopen it. So there we go. So. We showed you four different scenarios. We are working on developing a first time valve replacement uh, with the same kind of detail that we have the other examples. And um, we're still in the process, but we can say that a couple of things that you will see is uh, there won't be the same potential for reuse. Um, but there will be a less formal process than you would see in traditional advanced work packaging. When you look at uh, this project, the uh, process de-bottleneck project, it's around a $50 million de-bottlenecking project. It's quite complex. Um, it is a scenario where uh, you can't just use the last one and tweak it. You have to actually do a lot of planning. So this is going to look more like a traditional AWP project. There will be opportunities for uh, saving effort and uh, changing how it's resourced. Those will be coming out when we generate the report. So for these two, it's coming. We haven't got there yet, but we're working hard on it right now. So you might say, well, so what? We you know, why don't we just take the RT272 and apply that no matter what the project size is? Well, one of the reasons we're saying that just doesn't make sense is 
let's take a, a scenario where you're going to do something and there is two weeks worth of work and you've never done it before. So it's starting out as an unfamiliar project and it's starting out as a low complexity project. You have maintenance contractors that you use all the time. You don't go through three bids in a buy. Well, what we wanna do is we wanna run that project as efficiently as possible, but then we also wanna take advantage of the opportunity that if that's a project we're gonna do over and over again, we want to start moving it from a type two to a type one. We wanna start taking advantage of how we can take procurement and reduce costs, how we can share resources and reduce costs. We wanna start having internal resources that tell us we tried this contracting strategy and it worked this well. We tried this contracting strategy, it actually worked much better. And we want to use our results to actually drive our future behavior. So we believe that with, with the uh, use of scalable AWP, we'll be able to get much better results and we'll be able to get smarter as an organization. Now, we'll be doing our full report out at the COA conference on the 8th and 9th. The presentation of the scalability group will actually happen on the 9th of May and you'll get a lot more detail there so we strongly recommend that uh, you consider going to that our full report out of the scalability with the report is going to happen october 2nd and 3rd we're still going to be sending our report to cii to have them review it and add their comments and so the full report won't be ready until october but at that, you'll be able to get even more details. We will be releasing some things at the conference in uh, Calgary, or sorry, in Edmonton, the COA conference. That tool that we showed you will be made available. And uh, the work phase planning system that we're going to show you next will also be available at the COA conference. So there will be some concrete deliverables that we will get to you in uh, Edmonton and then the full report will be available in October. I'm going to hand it back to uh, Ben Swan now and he'll walk you through the work phase planning system. Excellent. Great job Lloyd and good morning everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, so in addressing scalability regarding work phase planning for all project types and sizes, we've expanded the IWP process that we find in the RT272 documentation. The diagram here is to illustrate a planning system for work phase planning, which breaks down the construction stage into um, five separate phases. This work phase planning system is designed to work like the IWP process in RT272. The difference though is that this work phase planning system is intended to recognize that smaller projects require team members to wear many hats. Whereas the IWP process in RT272 provides a functional delineation. So for example, activity in a function of QAQC, what does, that does not mean that a QC team member is required to perform that activity, just that it is a requirement of the system and can be performed by whomever it is assigned to, whether that be a foreman or a general foreman. Other functional tasks that will change is the regular superintendent meetings that we see in the, in the current IWP process in RT272. This will certainly be less in quantity on smaller projects. Additionally, the functional role of document control may not require a full document control department, but a shared role with a work phase planner or a superintendent or quality control, depending on the project team on the, on the small projects. The work phase planning system is currently made up of a RACI chart and a workflow for each of the phases. So let's cover off these two items before we get into the different phases. So the RACI chart that you see proposes functional roles along with the activities of each of the roles for every phase. The RACI charts along with the built-in functional role table and their activities provides a guideline for the contractors to standardize their work phase planning process and provide a tool in which to scale their process for any size of project. 
and referencing the work phase planning ratio chart, the phase becomes red with a bold font to identify the tasks in the chart belong to that phase. Further, if there are tasks that start in an earlier phase but continue through another phase, we'll find that that task is grayed out to indicate there is a continuation of this activity to the next phase. So the other part on the next slide is each of the phases have a typical workflow. The purpose of implementing an overall work phase planning system is to standardize the process of construction execution as well as increasing clarity in both the communication and collaboration during this stage. The intent of the workflow is to identify possible key inputs and outputs along with suggested activities for each phase that can be measured. We know that what gets measured gets improved and the result is an increase to the productivity of the work phase planning process through project data alignment and a new transparency in construction progress. So with the time that we have on the webinar, let's just simply walk through each of the phases via these construction phase workflows and I'll provide a high level overview of the system. So we're going to start on the next slide with the IWP scoping. The purpose of this phase is alignment. It's the alignment of drawings to quantities, to man hours, to schedule, and to turnover systems with the quantities and man hours aligned to the estimate by task to a tag level granularity. This phase is initiated when the contractor is awarded the contract for a project or in the EPC environment when the IFC drawing packages are issued to construction. And it is ideally an offsite activity to where the project is at. The focus here is alignment of man hours and quantities to finalize the contractor's cost code structure, ensure the schedule reflects any changes, and to have visible accuracy in quantity and man hours to ensure alignment of schedule and resources as the IWPs are produced through the IWP process. For the contractor, this is the first handoff they need to deal with as the project transitions from their estimating department to their project execution department. The inputs of this phase for the project team is the engineering information, whether they be EWPs, CWPs, scopes of work standards, SIDs, and the contractor's bid documents, proposal letters, bid clarifications, original estimate, and schedule. The outputs of this phase before we get into the IWP planning will be an IWP release plan, an ITP approved and a safe work plan approved. So that'll move us on to the next slide as we enter into IWP planning. This phase is initiated with the approval of the IWP release plan is in, and is an on-site activity. The focus here is the assembling of the IWPs and the constraint management of them. Work phase planners or a project delegate like a foreman or GF produce the IWPs in a, soft, in a soft format and print the IWPs prior to execution. Um, start to ensure constraints have been, re, uh, sorry, um, and print the IWPs prior to execution to ensure constraints have been managed and to minimize change management issues. Um, in the RT272 documentation, the, the reference there is um, printing the IWPs one to two weeks out prior. On some of these smaller projects, um, you've printing them out one or two days prior. Uh, when projects are process based and being turned over by systems, this phase will also be preparing for the dismantling and reassembling of IWPs into the system installation work packages. This process is best led by QC due to the required tracking of as-builts and QC exhibits. Additionally, if a software tool is being utilized, much of this process can be managed through a project database. An example of wearing many hats on smaller projects is to have those doing the planning transition to QC support role as the project progresses through with QC, and then back into the planning role as the project transitions to a system-based turnover where IWPs are disassembled and reassembled into system installation work packages. With the, the IWPs done, we move on to the next slide into IWP execution. Um, our focus is on the safest and most productive installation of material or the completion of tasks. The stage is initiated with the release of the first constraint-free IWPs, and the focus is the safe execution of IWP and sticking to the optimal path of construction or sticking to the sequence of the IWP release plan. 
This phase, all, this phase also manages the IWP punches and the completion of the system installation work packages if the project turnover is system-based, in which we will also be clearing system punches during this phase. As we move on to the next slide into quality control, our focus is on the va verification that the work is completed as per the ITP industry codes and the owner's specifications and standards. This stage is initiated when the first IWP is declared construction complete by construction. Preparation of this phase begins in project planning and the development of the ITP specific QC logs and ITRs or QC exhibits. With that, we move on to the next slide in the turnover. Here our focus is on the turnover of completed project documentation in the sequence requested by the owner. This stage is initiated when the first turnover binder is submitted to the owner, typically with all contractor A punches identified and cleared. This stage has two activities running in parallel to predetermined project milestones that are set by the owner. The first is office based with the clearing of all binder deficiencies found throughout the owner review process. And the second is a field base and starts with the final lockdown of the area or system depending on the project, which is predetermined by the owner. This process then continues with the clearing, verifying and validating that all punches in the field identified during the final lockdown have been properly closed. And with that, that's a wrap of a high level overview of the new work phase planning system. I'm looking forward to the COA best practice conference where we'll get into a lot more of the detail regarding all of the AWP scalability tools, including this work phase planning system. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Lloyd. Great. Well, uh, we're going to open it up to questions. One of the things I will tell you is in the report that we're going to be generating, there's going to be a fairly substantial section on acronyms because our industry loves to use three letter words and uh, uh, we're going to make sure that we have all of those properly defined for you. Uh, we're also going to have samples and examples and uh, guidance documents included in the final report. So let's uh, throw it open to questions and uh, uh, see if anybody has anything they want to know more about. Steve, you want to manage that for us? Sure, yeah. So we've got a couple different ways to um, ask questions of the panelists. You can send us a, a question via the Q&A uh, feature in your webinar panel. Um, you could send me a chat message or raise your hand um, and we can pass you the microphone. It looks like we have a raised hand from Mike Cletty. When you're ready, Mike, uh, go ahead and uh, ask uh, your question. You may need to unmute yourself, uh, Mike. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Perfectly. Just Good job. Um, just a quick question. Uh, one of the things we're seeing a lot of is the evolution of digitalization and the use of digital tools and so forth. With your processes and so forth and all the different things you're doing here, how are you taking advantage of, I guess you're going to say, the, the world that we're, we're moving forward to rapidly, digitalization? So be interested to hear, hear that. Thank you. Uh who on the team would like to respond to that? I can respond to that. I think that um, what's important is that it's the people, the process, and then the technology. There's a lot of technology and the advancement of technology and the digitization. Um, but if we don't have a standardized process that we can gain some consistency with, um, then digitization of uh, what we do in this industry is not going to help us. It's going to hinder us. And so I think that the first thing we need to be able to do is standardize the process. Um, digitizing and automating this process, there are tools that are, are entering the field that can do this, um, do different aspects of it and do complete aspects of it. Um, I think that you're going to see a lot more tools that are not 3D um, based on these smaller scalable projects because they're not built or engineered in a 3D model. 
Okay, Randy, I think, raised his hand as well. Did you have anything to add, Randy? Yeah, I guess I just wanted to say that um, um, the, the, the format of how we convey the information and, and track the, the status of material, we can do those things through fairly conventional means or fairly advanced means in, in fairly advanced digital systems. But, but just to conf confirm or, or come in agreement with what Ben is saying is how we actually package up the scope to align with how construction is going to build it is still very key. And, and the scalable um, um, effort that's required at, uh, for smaller projects is still important for us to focus on that we don't, we don't uh, use processes that, that end up ballooning the cost, similar to what Lloyd had mentioned about that $170 million job turning into $220 um, just because we, we overmanaged. Right. Okay, um, Mike, who originally asked the question, anything further on that? No, thank okay. you. It's just, thank you. Perfect, thank you. Good question, Mike. Okay, so we've got about five, five minutes here if anybody else would like to um, ask a question. Otherwise, if uh, any of the uh, panelists uh, would like to expand on anything else that was uh, discussed in the presentation, now's a good time as well. Well, uh, I, I'm planning on making a blatant pitch. Uh, we've, uh, we've had a great team working on this for some time. And uh, as you can see, we still have a little more work left to do. If anybody on the line is interested in either finding more, finding out more or getting involved, uh, we would love to know. So uh, you can send a message to Steve uh, indicating that you would like to either discuss the matter further or possibly be included on uh, one of our working committees and uh, we will follow up and get back to you. And Adrian has a question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, my question uh, pertains to application of uh, AWP on, uh, you know, smaller projects, but uh, without the involvement of the owner, because not all, all owners are familiar with the, with the use. Uh, do you have any data points or any, you know, industry surveys or case studies where contractors have out of their own initiative to manage their work better, use work packaging without any direct involvement from the owner? That's a great question. Um, I, I have not seen any studies on that. Um, I am working with a major oil company uh, and they're attempting to um, implement AWP both corporately and project level. Um, <clears throat> one of the challenges for the contractors is uh, you almost have to have the owner aware of what the benefits are. And we're starting to see more and more uh, cases where the owners are looking for competence in AWP in their contractor community. Um, I, I saw that just recently both in Paris and in London where the owners are saying they want it, but they don't really know what it is. And so, there's, there's some things that can be done by the contractor in terms of trying to educate the owner, but I think the, um, you got a bit of an uphill battle if the owner isn't already predisposed to doing AWP. Anybody else on the team got any comments or thoughts? I think that um, from about 2004 to 2008, CO approved the. There is definite advantages to the contractor in implementing work phase planning, but we also by 2008 identified that um, there's a lot of activities on the feed side of a project that uh, greatly determine the effectiveness of a work phase planning system. 
Yeah, and I, I can offer that that like I my name is Randy. I come from come from Fleur, and and we typically include AWP on on small jobs for for lump sum, for example, where we would have a lot more direct influence on on the use of that uh, system outside outside the owner. So that would be an environment where that would be uh, applicable. So um, I see that it's uh, just about 10 o'clock now. So I, I think we uh, should uh, close down the uh, webinar. But if you have any questions, if there's a uh, need for further discussion, please send us a message and we will follow up with you. I'd like to thank everybody from, for taking time from their busy schedule to be here. And uh, uh, speaking on behalf of the uh, AWP steering committee, we need your input to, uh, to make this um, model as effective as possible. So if you have any thoughts, we really want to hear from you. And at that, Steve, can you just uh, shut down the webinar? Absolutely. Thanks again, everybody. Talk to you again next time. Thank you.